On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers, Do Thomas Minor and Angela Paddock. Dr. Thomas Minor is board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine. He graduated from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine, pulmonary, and critical care training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Devoting much of his time to treating sleep disorders, Dr. Minor sees patients at Boulder Valley Pulmonology. Dr. Angela Paddock is board certified in otolaryngology. Uh, she earned her medical degree at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center and completed her residency in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Paddock provides the full range of adult and pediatric ear, nose, and throat conditions. She enjoys helping patients with their breathing and sleep issues and has been working with Inspire, a minimally invasive surgical alternative to CPAP since 2019. Dr. Paddock sees patients at Boulder Medical Center. Welcome to tonight's speakers. All right. Good evening, we're gonna start our presentation. I'll start with the first part, and then uh, Dr. Paddock will be completing the part where we talk about surgical options. So tonight's agenda, we're gonna talk about the different types of sleep apnea, the diagnosis of sleep apnea, how we make it, and typical treatments, and then Dr. Paddock is gonna go into some details about uh, the, an advance in, uh, in the treatment of sleep apnea the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So what's sleep apnea? So let's start with that. Uh, apnea means without breath. It's literally the Greek translation is without breath. And it means you're not breathing. Sleep apnea means you're not breathing at night. And this occurs in little bursts where you temporarily stop breathing. And there's two main types. The first type that you'll probably hear most about is obstructive sleep apnea. And that's where the back of the airway closes down when we go to sleep. So no, normally when all of us right now are breathing, we have a patent nose and mouth that go back down to the back of our throat and the air is moving down through, uh, through that through it, and, it's, and it's open. We're getting uh, air continuously through, that, uh, through that, those passages. When we sleep though, we, first we lay down, that may cause some of the tissues to sag a little bit, but also the muscles relax, we start to lose control of those muscles at some time, and if people are vulnerable to obstructive sleep apnea, the patients that have obstructive sleep apnea, that airway will narrow and potentially even close. It doesn't have to completely close, it can just narrow enough that you start to struggle to get air in because the back of the throat is kind of closed down. You can see from that diagram, the upper part, the little ribbon-like blue part is going through the, the air, going through the nose, which is our preferred way of breathing at night is through the nose and it's going back but it gets stuck right at the back of the soft palate which is that tissue that's kind of bouncing against the back of the uh, back back of the throat either narrowing or closing that so the air can't get through that through that passageway the other option is for the air to get through the mouth so often if we're, our nose is blocked we might open our mouths uh, when we sleep the air will go through our mouth but then you can see that that our air is being blocked by the tongue which is sitting right below the soft palate that's plan B is for the air to go through the mouth, but sometimes it can't. Again, it doesn't have to be a complete stoppage of breathing. That would be called an apnea or a complete stoppage of breathing. You can also have a hypopnea, which is an, uh, an under breathing or a low breathing. And that's where your body is not completely, you've not completely stopped breathing, but you're struggling to breathe. And we can measure that and we can see that your, your oxygen levels are going down, the, the amount of air you're moving is going down, you're, kind of, you're, you're struggling, and those we call hypopneas. So, we know that about 20 million pay, uh, people across the United States have got moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, and the majority of them have not been diagnosed and are not, and so therefore are not on treatment. You can, here's a di you can see this diagram kind of shows what happens to our oxygen levels when we have sleep apnea. You can see it starts to the left. Oxygen levels are kind of rising at the end during that, where the, that vertical white bar uh, in the first section under where it says 47 seconds. Uh, oxygen levels are rising because the patient started to breathe, but then they're struggling to breathe. Their oxygen levels are, are starting to sag. They go down. 
Finally, it terminates right where it says 84 uh, percent is the low oxygen levels. What happens at that point is that typically we, we have a little awakening, a arousal, and you may not remember those arousals in the morning. You may not, uh, or you may not even be aware of them at night. But they're kind of stimulating your brain. Your brain kind of wakes up and says, "Hey, there's something going on. This is an emergency. You've got to start breathing." And so the muscles tense up, open up that airway, you start breathing. The oxygen levels go up, but then the cycle can repeat again and again. That may happen intermittently. Or I have some patients who, literally, I tell them. You can only sleep as long as you can, you know, uh, uh, or you can only breathe for 20, you know, for 20 seconds at a time or so while you're asleep. When, or when you go to sleep, you stop breathing. Then you have to wake up basically to breathe every single breath. And patients that have really severe obstructive sleep apnea, they can only sleep as long as they can hold their breath. So you can see there's two cycles of somebody, but people, patients can have uh, dozens to hundreds of these per night. The other type of central of, of sleep apnea is called central sleep apnea. And the difference is, we said one was obstructive, that's a obstru physical obstruction in the back of the throat. Central sleep apnea refers to the central nervous system. So what that means is that your brain is now determining you have central sleep apnea. And this occurs when the, the brain system for kind of regulating our breathing so it's nice and steady like it is during the day pretty much if we're sitting at rest, that doesn't work as well as it should. And what happens is the brain kind of tells your, your body to overbreathe, and then it gets ahead of itself and it drops its carbon, your carbon dioxide level and the oxygen levels go up. But then it, get, it has some sensors that tell us, that, that tell the brain that, oh, the, the, oxygen, the carbon dioxide level's too low, you got plenty of oxygen, so just stop breathing, turn off the system, and so you stop breathing. And then that cycle starts all over again. The carbon dioxide levels go up, the oxygen levels go down, and then your brain gets some signals to start. So you really are over-breathing and under-breathing uh, uh, as part of this, this pattern. That's a much less common form of, uh, of sleep apnea than obstructive sleep apnea, which is vastly predominant across, uh, you know, across the world. However, here at altitude, central sleep apnea becomes much more prominent. At this altitude of the front range, about 20% of patients who have sleep apnea have a comp at least a component of central sleep apnea. And if you get into higher altitude, you'll get even higher uh, frequencies of that. I know myself, and, and a lot of people will express this, you go up to go ski in the mountains, and the first night can be a kind of a crappy night of sleep. You probably have uh, developed central sleep apnea when you go up to high altitude. It tends to be made worse with alcohol, which sometimes goes with going up to the mountains. And that will typically, when many patients will get better, especially people who go from the front range up, that may get better after the first couple days. But in patients who stay there, who live at high altitude, they're more likely to have central sleep apnea all the time. And that approaches 30 to 40% of patients who have sleep apnea up at altitude will have central sleep apnea. So in terms of how we, we, we were next going to talk about diagnosing sleep apnea, the signs and symptoms, taking a sleep history, and then a couple of the tests we can do to confirm a diagnosis of sleep apnea. So I generally tell people when I'm seeing them in the office, there's, there's really about three reasons that people are getting evaluated for sleep apnea. The first is the top one in the middle there, the snoring bed partner. The first one is that you're pissing somebody off or you're scaring somebody. So you've got a bed partner that's listening to you snore, they can't sleep, uh, or they're listening to you stop breathing and they're worried about you because you're laying there and you're not breathing and they think you might be dying. So that's one of the reasons that patients get referred to us is because a bed partner is concerned or just annoyed. Uh, the second reason is because you're the, the sleep apnea will tend to fragment your sleep and cause symptoms. So you may report, you may feel that your sleep itself is not, uh, is not satisfactory. You may notice that you're waking up a lot at night for a kind of unknown reasons. You have kind of this, and you may be actually able to put your finger on it that you say, I wake up gasping and I can't breathe and I'm choking. But for many patients, it's just they don't know why they woke up. It happened so fast. And they have difficulty getting into sleep because you remember when I talked about the obstructive sleep apnea, one of the ways that those events end is that your brain gets this, this emergency kind of alert signal to start breathing and wake up. You wake up, your brain waves pick up for a couple seconds, this brief arousal, you go back to sleep. But you may not go back to as deep a sleep as you were in before you had those respiratory events. So your sleep can become more fragmented, lots of arousals, may not be as deep. When, you're, when you do go into that deeper sleep and you're really relaxed, you start having more events, so your brain just kind of amps it up and you, you don't get to stay in that nice, uh, more contiguous, restorative sleep. You may also find that people sometimes will uh, get up and say they uh, they just they have to go to the bathroom three or four times a night. They don't know why, and sometimes that's a urologic problem. But sometimes, it's that people will wake up, 
and they'll um, they'll because they had sleep apnea, and then they'll wake up and say, "Oh, I have to go. To, I might as well have to go to the bathroom." So they'll go to the bathroom and they'll report that they're going to the bathroom because they had to pee, but really it's because they had sleep apnea. And if we treat the sleep apnea, sometimes that can get better. The other thing is that not only will you have maybe uh, a sense of non of, uh, non of sleep that's not good quality, but it also can have daytime consequences because if you're not getting that good, deep, contiguous sleep, you may not feel refreshed in the morning. So you may turn out, you know, go to bed, sleep eight solid hours. You think it's, you know, you don't have any reason to think it's not good quality sleep, but you wake in the <laughs> up in the morning and you can't understand why you don't want to feel refreshed. Well, really, it's because you got annoyed and woken up potentially hundreds of times in the night. And then so you may feel fatigued, sleepy, tired during the day, more irritable, less able to concentrate, memory difficulties, all the things that can come from being sleep deprived. The third reason that we treat sleep apnea has become much more prominent in the last 10 to 20 years. And that's because of the associated uh, medical risks that we have from untreated sleep apnea. And those, the, the, the biggest ones, the ones we, we talk the most about are the cardiovascular risks. Because we know that untreated sleep apnea increases is associated with a whole bunch of cardiovascular problems and largely it seems to be actually uh, contributing to those as a risk factor so we know for instance that the first uh, the first uh, uh, relationship that was really well established was hypertension that uh, patients who have untreated sleep apnea are much more risk for having hypertension uh, the risk for that hypertension to be difficult to treat. So if you're taking three or more medications, it's a very likely that you have untreated sleep apnea. And there's also studies that have shown that if you treat the sleep apnea, you improve the high blood pressure. You don't, prove, you don't usually make it go away, but you can make it better. Uh, and the reason for that, and for a lot of these cardiovascular problems uh, associated with sleep apnea, is because of the stress that your body is undergoing at night. Your body, much like your mind, wants to rest at night and wants to go to sleep, but when it's repeatedly being woken up, your heart, your cardiovascular system are getting these emergency alarms, there's adrenaline surges, cortisol surges, and they, they're they really not getting to, to, to do the relaxing sleep at night they'd like. Normally, your blood pressure drops at night, your heart rate goes down, your body is like healing itself from the day, but your heart can't do that if it's repeatedly getting these kind of you know fire alarms that are going off all night. Uh, Almost every other cardio, most other cardiovascular problem that you can have is related, is also associated with sleep apnea. So if you have untreated sleep apnea, you have a higher risk of developing coronary artery disease, of having a heart attack, having strokes, having uh, atrial fibrillation. If you have atrial fibrillation, it's, you're, more, you know, you're more likely to develop atrial fibrillation. And if you have it, it's harder for your doctors to get you out of atrial fibrillation and keep you out of atrial fibrillation. You're more likely to have more PVCs and other arrhythmias. Uh, you're more likely to have pulmonary hypertension. You're more likely to have uh, heart failure, and the heart failure can be more difficult to treat. So all these cardiovascular problems uh, are associated with, with uh, untreated sleep apnea. And if we treat sleep apnea, there's evidence for pretty much all of those that we can improve your cardiovascular outcomes. We can improve your blood pressure control with less medications, potentially. We can reduce your risk of heart attacks and strokes. We can reduce your risk of going back into atrial fibrillation or having PVCs. We can reduce your risk, we can reduce your pulmonary pressures if you have pulmonary hypertension and we, and we treat that. We can also help improve your, uh, your uh, you can also improve uh, congestive heart failure. So the, in addition to the cardiovascular uh, associations that we have with sleep apnea, there's others such as we know that glucose control in diabetics is harder when you have untreated sleep apnea and sleep deprivation. So we can potentially improve diabetic control. Uh, there's an, an association with, um, with Alzheimer's and dementia. It's not been shown that treating it actually reduces that risk. Uh, there's not definitive evidence for that, but there is an association that, they, that the sleep apnea may be related to that. Uh, in addition to all those cardiovascular risks and the other medical risks, and there's, also, there's others including impotence, uh, erectile dysfunction, um, we also know that people who have untreated sleep apnea, as you can imagine, have or tend to be more sleepy during the day, and they can see consequences from that. Uh, my, the most notable one is motor vehicle accidents. So patients with untreated sleep apnea have a have several fold higher likelihood of having uh, a motor vehicle accident. That's why commercial drivers are actually mandated if, uh, to be screened, tested, and diagnosed, and treated for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, is as part of their having a commercial driver's license. But even patient, even in uh, people who don't drive commercially, you're at a higher risk for having a motor vehicle accident if you have untreated sleep apnea. So we talked about kind of some of the signs and symptoms uh, can include being sleepy and tired, snoring. 
just because you don't snore doesn't mean you don't have sleep apnea. Most people who snore have sleep apnea, about 90% or so, but you might not have snoring and still have sleep apnea. You also might not have reliable bed partners. Plenty of people I see who can't, their bed partner can't really report as to whether or not they have snoring because they go to bed first, they sleep like a log, and then they wake up and the snoring's all over. Uh, we talked about some of the symptoms as well. It's important to note too, in terms of the diagnosis, we take a sleep history. Um, and so we'll talk about how long are you sleeping? Are you getting adequate sleep? Is that the reason you're sleepy? Could there be other things that could be disturbing your sleep? A couple important things to know about sleep apnea. One is that we, there's, a, there's a, an assumption that patients who have sleep apnea are obese. That is a risk factor for sleep apnea, but about 30% of patients who have sleep apnea are not obese. So you can be thin, healthy, and, and otherwise have no, no apparent risk factors from the outside, but actually you can still have sleep apnea and can have severe sleep apnea. I see patients that have a completely normal body mass index, thin, athletic, and they have moderate to severe sleep apnea. Uh, it's also important to note that you don't have to be sleepy. About 30% of patients who have sleep apnea are not sleepy. And we don't know why some patients uh, are not sleepy. And I see patients that have horrible sleep apnea, and I look at, their, I look at their, their sleep through the night when I do a study on them, and it looks terrible, and they feel absolutely fine. They're just, for some reason, their brain is very resilient and is not sensitive to it. Some patients have mild sleep apnea and feel miserable. We treat them, and they get better. So once we've taken the sleep history, we've talked to you a little bit about, you know, about what's going on, and we think there's enough risk that you might have sleep apnea that we should pursue, we have to do a diagnostic test to, to determine that you have sleep apnea. Um, there's a couple things we can do. One is you can do an overnight oximetry. That's just the simplest test. You put a little probe on your finger, measure your oxygen levels overnight, records them when we look for the pattern. If we see your oxygen levels going up and down and up and down during the night, we suspect you have sleep apnea. But that test won't diagnose it. Insurance companies won't accept it. I could look at that oximetry and say, I am. I would bet my house that you've got sleep apnea, but an insurance company won't pay for treatment. So that, although that's potentially a, a, one of the diagnostic tools we have, it doesn't really clinch the diagnosis. In order to do the diagnosis, we have to have a formal sleep study. And those come in two flavors. One is a polysomnogram, a nocturnal polysomnogram, also known as a sleep study. And that's where you go into the sleep lab, you spend a night there, and we hook you up to all kinds of monitors. It, you would think that you wouldn't be able to sleep. I mean, you've got 20 or so wires attached to you from kind of head to toe. Surprisingly, most people sleep. I've had a study. I had one when I was training, and I was able to go to sleep pretty well. So most people can sleep on them. And what we're doing is we're, we're, we have bands that are around your chest. We have monitors in your nose. We also have uh, that are measuring your, your, your breathing. That's the kind of the core component of it. But we also have uh, monitors on your, uh, on your brain to make sure to, to determine whether you're asleep or not. And we have uh, monitors to measure your oxygen level and your body position and all that. And you can see from the, from the uh, diagram on the right there, this is somebody that's having some uh, respiratory events. The bottom channel is the oximetry, and that just shows the oximetry gradually going up and going down. The next two channels above that are the effort channels. So those are bands around your, your, your abdomen and your belly, or your abdomen and your chest. And those are looking at whether your chest is moving to, uh, and your abdomen are moving, how they're moving in relation to one another. So you can see in this person, and this, uh, they're having, this is kind of one event over a period of about uh, 40 seconds to a minute or so. And you can see those bottom two channels, they're moving pretty pretty well at the beginning and then they kind of start to disappear and get almost flat and then they pick up again. So that's a, that's a respiratory event. The next two channels above that are actually the flow. So we're measuring air at the nose and the mouth. And you can see those do the same thing. They start out moving and then it gets flatter and actually goes completely flatline. So those would be considered an apnea. And the channels at the top are the brain waves that show that the patient's asleep. So we can do that nocturnal polysomnogram. That test uh, really is one of the tests that we can be done to confirm a diagnosis of sleep apnea. The, the advantage of that test is that we can tell pretty definitively whether you're awake or asleep, so we don't kind of get mixed up or confused if you, uh, whether or not you were asleep for the study or, and, we're, and we're measuring these respiratory events. We also can potentially start treatment. So often your, your physician can decide whether or not your provider can decide whether they want to do just determine whether you have sleep apnea the whole night. Or they can also order the test such that you, if you have sleep apnea, if you meet certain criteria, they'll actually put you on treatment, usually which is CPAP, which we'll talk about a little bit later and you may be familiar with. So one of the advantages is that we can actually start treatment and see your response to treatment and see if you tolerate the treatment. We can adjust it, we can find out the right pressures and all that. Disadvantages, it's a night away from home and it's 
and it's more expensive than the alternative. The alternative is a home sleep test. That's where we do more or less the same thing. Uh, not all the, te the tests actually measure your chest and abdomen directly. They may measure it kind of indirectly, but basically you do the whole test at home and uh, they'll hook you up to some, mon uh, to some monitors. You just turn it on, go to sleep, turn it back into your doctor or your provider, and then we'll interpret the results and, and we'll get, be able to get a report. The advantage of that study is it's done from home, it's done a night away from home, and it's less expensive. The disadvantage is there's nobody there to monitor you. If like, things fall off, you may get a bad test if you didn't put this, if this stuff kind of, if the uh, finger probe came off, it's just basically an invalid test. Um, we also can't put you on treatment that first, uh, that first night, so we don't know if, you know, if uh, we can't try CPAP and see whether <coughs> So the treatment options, moving on to different treatment options. First, I'm gonna talk about CPAP. So you may be familiar with that. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. So that's a machine that sits usually on your nightstand right next to you. Most of them are about this big nowadays, attached to a, a tube that then goes to your nose, to a, to a mask that covers your nose and your or nose and mouth. And it does have to seal. You see the person on the left there, the man on the left. Um, he's got a mask that's attached to his, covering just his nose. Um, if you're a mouth breather, you may need one that covers your nose and mouth. And that has to fit securely and, and, uh, and, and has to not have any leaks. So it's not like a little nasal cannula like you might use for oxygen. Uh, it has to seal, so it's got straps that come around the back of your head. And that's applying continuous positive airway pressure. So what that means is that it's the same pressure all the time, whether you breathe in or out. And it's positive pressure, meaning it's higher than the atmospheric pressure. And what it's doing is it's stenting open the airways by, by putting a little pressure on the inside of the airways, or sometimes a lot. It'll take and push those tissues apart and keep them from collapsing. And in doing that, it lets you breathe. Now, the machine's not breathing for you. It's not a ventilator. It just pushes the, the, the tissues uh, apart and keeps the uh, and keeps the airway open. So then you can do your normal breathing. Uh, the benefits of CPAP are that it's highly likely to work in obstructive sleep apnea. I'd say it's about 50-50 in central sleep apnea, but it's very likely to work in, in obstructive sleep apnea. It'll work in even most even most uh, severe cases of uh, sleep apnea. Um, other advantages, we can usually get it started pretty quickly. So you can, uh, uh, if we order it, your insurance can approve it. We can get you started. I've had patients start, if they really are pushing for it, they can get, go, get started within a day or so. Um, usually within a couple of weeks, we can get you started on treatment. You'll get the benefit typically immediately from it. And we can also know whether or not you're doing well on it right away. We can know if it's effective. And you can even know if it's effective because the modern devices have actually got cloud-based uh, software such that as soon as you put on it, you, you, if you want, you can register on the cloud. You can have your eye, your smartphone, and you can see the next night how, how, well you, how long you slept, how much leak you had, and how many respiratory events you had. It actually can measure the respiratory events. Your, your provider can also get that information, so that's a routine visit. If I see you back after I put you on CPAP, one of the, one of the things I'm gonna insist on is a report on how much you're using it and how effective it is, and I can really get a lot of data from that on how, how well it's working. The drawback to CPAP, the cost, uh, it's, it's gonna be a couple, typically up to a couple thousand dollars for the, for the device. It will be covered by your insurance, um, but if you have a high deductible plan, that may not help you that much. And also it's, the, it's just the intolerance. It's just wearing a mask every night. It's kind of the least sexy of the uh, treatments we have for sleep, for sleep apnea. But you know, a lot of patients may have initial resistance to it, but usually we can, a, we can work through those, you know, if you have challenges with it, if you're finding that, you know, the humidity is not right, you just don't like it on your face, um, pressure's too high, pressure's too low. We kind of have strategies that we can kind of talk, I can talk to my patients, what exactly about it is bothering you. There's some things I can't change. I mean, if you cannot have anything on your face, this is not gonna be the treatment for you. But if we can work on it, we can desensitize you to that. We can find the right mask that works for you. We can adjust the humidity, the pressures. We can, I, most patients I can work through this and I can probably get 80 to 90% of patients so they can tolerate CPAP. The other thing is to also help educate patients as to why they're on it. Some patients, if they're not symptomatic, they're saying, why did I get put on this? They get put on it, it's, in the, it's, get, it's put in the closet because it's, it's not necessarily the most comfortable thing, but they really understand the long-term benefits for it, then that they may be more invested in it and put more efforts into it and, and can actually learn to tolerate it and maybe not learn to love it, but at least can learn to live with it. So tolerance is the, probably one of the biggest challenges that we have in CPAP, but as I said, we, we've got strategies to kind of work through that and try to help a lot of patients get through it. Uh, there are other types of PAP therapies. I mentioned central sleep apnea. So if you have central sleep apnea, um, CPAP may or may not work. 
Uh, sometimes you have a mix of the two, and you, you may try uh, you may try CPAP for a mix of obstructive and central sleep apnea, and the obstructives may go away, but the centrals may stay. There are other options for treating central sleep apnea. Probably the most effective one is called ASV or adaptive cerebral ventilation. That's kind of like a, a, a CPAP therapy, except it increases the pressure when you breathe in and drops it when you breathe out. And it's got an algorithm where it can, where as you breathe, as you go through those periods where you're over breathing, it'll kind of attenuate those. It'll drop the pressure so it's, it makes it a little bit harder. And then those parts where you've stopped breathing, it'll actually start to push air into you a little bit more. Unlike the CPAP, which I said isn't pushing air in, this one actually will kind of push the air into you a little bit. So it kind of makes the big breath smaller and the little breaths bigger. In doing so, it can kind of stabilize things. So that's the ASV is, an, is a more sophisticated version of CPAP. It's actually a more sophisticated version of BiPAP, but it's in the same family. The machine looks identical. Uh, it'll just be more comfortable for patients often, and it uh, can treat the central sleep apnea. If you have central sleep apnea, there's other options too. Oxygen can sometimes help, actually can often help, especially in, for those of us who have high altitude uh, central sleep apnea. A lot of patients will ask me, hey, why don't I just go on oxygen? Because that'll treat all those low oxygen levels that I'm getting from, from sleep apnea. The problem is it may make the oxygen levels look good, but it's not actually getting rid of the apnea. So you still have that activation, the sleep disruption, the cortisol levels, the adrenaline, all those things are still going on because you still have the events which still scare your body. You'll keep the oxygen levels. It's, it's really kind of treating only half the problem. But it can fully treat central sleep apnea. And I have some patients that all they need is oxygen. They don't need PAP or anything else like that. They don't need CPAP, ASV, and that'll treat the central sleep apnea. Uh, and there's some other options for, that, uh, that we can use for central sleep apnea as well. I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, another option is an oral appliance. So oral appliances are custom mouthpieces, and a lot of people, patients may be familiar with, with uh, bite guards for, for uh, they have for grinding teeth. This is like that, it's custom fit, but it's more robust than that. It's not like a thin plastic thing that's just meant to kind of protect your teeth from touching one another. It's usually a pretty solid acrylic, and you have a, one plate for the top and one for the bottom, and then the two are connected with a retaining kind of device that basically pushes the lower jaw forward. So it pulls the lower jaw forward, and in doing that, it pulls the tongue and the soft palate will tend to go with it a little bit, and it creates some space in the back of the throat, uh, in the back of the throat and helps stabilize that from collapsing. Um, so those are usually, there's kind of three flavors of those. You can do the least expensive kind is boil and bite ones you can find online for a hundred bucks or so. Those are just like, just like you would have done for sports, uh, you know, in high school or whatever. You put them in hot water, you bite down and you're custom fitting it, or you're not really custom fitting it, you're fitting it to yourself, but you're kind of doing it on your own. Um, they may work, they're the least likely to work because you're not, they're not engaging the teeth real well. To have them effective, you really need to be able to pull that jaw forward, preferably about as maximum as you can and still be comfortable. Um, with those devices, uh, with those home devices, uh, the next level would be to have your dentist fix them. So you can go to your dentist. Many dentists do this. They have variable kind of quality in terms of their experience with them, but they can fit the custom. They can fit a custom uh, device. It'll probably be more effective than one you would get. And then the last level is there are some dentists that this is their exclusive practice. They really dedicate to it. They're often are specialists in TMJ or uh, temporal, temporal mandibular or joint uh, problems as well. So they're, I think, most uh, comfortable in terms of managing these, managing the complications from them. The main complications are TMJ problems, tooth, uh, tooth movement, discomfort, occlusion problems, things like that. Uh, they, they can sometimes, these devices can sometimes break uh, from, uh, from you know, cr cracking or grinding. They will correct your bruxism or your teeth clenching and gr or your teeth grinding anyways as well because they really protect the teeth well. The main limitations, these are probably pretty good most of the time for patients with mild or mild to moderate sleep apnea. If a patient comes to me with severe sleep apnea, they want to try, to, uh, try an oral appliance, tell them it's, oh, it's reasonable, to, not unreasonable to try it, but your chances it's going to work are probably 50% or less. It's really going to be effective, and it's not going to be effective. There's almost no chance that it's going to be effective as a properly fit CPAP mask and CPAP pressure settings. Another option is positional therapy. Sometimes we'll find that uh, in about 50% of patients, uh, your sleep apnea is worse when you're on your back than when you're on your side. Uh, and for some patients, they're actually normal on their sides. And, and a lot of patients may reflect this when they, we talk about their history. They'll, they'll tell us, I don't snore when I'm on my side. I do when I'm on my back. And the same thing can be true for, for sleep apnea, that uh, it'll be worse on your back. So sometimes that's all it takes, or at least that can help. So for some patients, if they can't tolerate anything else, Maybe the treatment is just, well, try to stay on your side. You know, you're 70% better on your side. It's not normal, but it's as good as we can get. 
or we can make other treatments work better. For instance, oral appliances, if you have mild to moderate sleep apnea, um, if we use an oral appliance, uh, it's most likely to be effective if we're able to keep, uh, keep you sleeping off your back. People say, how do I do that? There's a couple little tricks. There's the, the old standby is to get a t-shirt, put a, sew a pocket in the back, drop some tennis balls or wiffle balls into it. So that way, when you go roll over on your back, it's kind of like getting the nudge from the bed partner when you're snoring. It basically, it's a little uncomfortable, wakes you up, you get off your back. You can also, you know, arrange your pillows and all and try to try to... Uh, keep yourself from going in your back. Um, the other options, they show a couple of options here. That you could, There's a whole different, all different flavors of those kind of black belts, and there's little camelback-like packs with things. All of them are pretty similar. You have bolsters or something in your back to, just to keep you from being on your back. That little blue thing around the neck is a little, it's a little vibrating device that when you go on your back, it kind of vibrates kind of like your phone does. That's about 400 bucks if you really want to geek out on it. it it'll, you can download stuff and you can find out how much you're snoring and spending different times on your back. Most people just try tennis balls in the, in the back, pillows, or they'll try uh, one of those devices like that back device uh, to try to keep you off your back. Lastly, there's uh, tr surgical treatment options, and for that I'm going to turn it over to Angela Paddock to talk about surgical treatment options for sleep apnea. Hey, so I am uh, Dr. Angie Paddock, and I am an ear, nose, and throat doctor. Um, I work for Boulder Medical Center, and so Dr. Miner just did a great overview of sleep apnea and what it is and why we need to treat it. Um, and kind of as he mentioned, CPAP is kind of the standard of care, um, and most people that have moderate to severe sleep apnea probably should or do need to try the CPAP. Um, first, and a lot of people tolerate it a lot better than they, they think they will. So, um, but I think a lot of you are here tonight because say maybe you or someone you know doesn't tolerate the CPAP very well and wonders if there's other options. Um, so we have a lot of options and I'm gonna kind of run through some of these so we can have time for questions. But basically, I mean, surgical options for sleep apnea can range from something as minimal as a um, in-office turbinate reduction to help with nasal congestion. Um, to something as dramatic as getting like your jaw broken and move forward to open up your airway. Um, and you know, that can include septoplasty, turbinate reduction, getting your tonsils out, um, a palatoplasty. Um, sometimes you can pull the hyoid up and that pulls the tongue base up. Um, and then there's Inspire. Um, so we're gonna talk about Inspire a little bit more in detail today. And basically the hypoglossal nerve stimulator um, is something that basically you've got two little leads. So basically in this picture, you can see that there's a sense lead down at the bottom in the upper chest. Um, and that sits in between your ribs. And basically every time you breathe in, it sends a signal up to this lead, which is connected to your hypoglossal nerve. And the hypoglossal nerve is the nerve that moves your tongue back and forth. And so as Dr. Miner already mentioned, a lot of times, especially when you're sleeping on your back, your tongue will fall backwards along with your palate and that obstructs you. And then that's what wakes you up. So the Inspire works a lot more specifically um, to manage this area of obstruction. And so once you get the signal that you're breathing, that sends a signal up here to the hypoglossal nerve to push the tongue forward. So now instead of being collapsed, you're open um, and you're breathing better. So Inspire indications, they actually just got um, expanded. Um, it's indicated for anybody that has moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Um, currently, most insurances are covering up to AHI of 65. Um, we just got approval um, to go up to 100, and we expect insurances to follow that, but they haven't yet. Um, you also have to have tried CPAP first, um, because I think, again, a lot of patients will actually tolerate CPAP better than they expect. Um, you have to have a BMI requirement, which currently it's around 32 to 35, although that was just increased as well in the um, um, indications expanded, and I think these indications have been expanded because we've shown that patients with a higher BMI or a higher AHI are still getting benefit from the Inspire, and so that's what's what's kind of moving forward, what's going to happen. Um, you also have to, so you meet criteria basically based on your sleep study, um, which means you have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. You can have some central apnea, but it can't be more than 25%, um, and then so that's kind of your number criteria, and then you have to meet an anatomic criteria. And so basically that's called a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Um, and basically we put you to sleep, you're still breathing on your own, but you don't remember or feel anything, and I have a little camera in your nose, and I basically wash the top part of your palate. And the main reason we do that is because we don't want to do a procedure on someone and it not work. And so um, we watch 
as you're snoring, if your palate kind of flops back and forth and collapses this way, then we know you're gonna be a pretty good candidate for the Inspire. If you start collapsing completely circumferentially or laterally, um, the Inspire may not be as good of an option for you. So our goal in all of these kind of requirements protocols are to basically make sure that we implant this in someone that is gonna do well with it afterward. So it's typically an outpatient procedure. Um, and in this picture on the left, you can see that's what the battery looks like. And that sits in um, the chest wall incision as well. Um, and the only thing you really have to kind of keep track of or hold on to is the remote, which you can see the guy holding in the right picture. Um, and a misconception I think to some people is that this device is on all the time. It's not on all the time. It's basically off until you turn it on. And then they have some pretty cool features where the goal is that you're asleep before anything happens. So if it takes you 20 minutes to get to sleep, they can set the timer for it to actually start at 30 minutes. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of patients that maybe can't tolerate the CPAP, some of them are claustrophobic or have other issues and they can't get to sleep with something kind of going on up on uh, their face. And so this kind of helps prevent that. Um, so, Basically, it's two incisions. When they first got approved through the FDA, it was three incisions. Now it's two. So there's one that's um, kind of in the upper chest, and then there's one right under the jawline. Those are both five centimeter incisions. Um, it's a pretty quick recovery. Um, I do give a couple pain meds for the night or two after surgery, but a lot of people are just taking Tylenol after that. Um, you can do non strenuous activities afterward. Um, there is some limitation on. Um, kind of right arm movement that you can do for a few weeks after. Um, but overall, there's you know not a major kind of like recovery period besides the recovery of the incisions and stuff, which takes about a week. Um, the battery life right now, the shelf life is about 11 years. Um, so you know if the battery wears out after 11 years, the procedure to replace that is a lot easier than doing the actual Inspire. We just kind of go in through that lower incision and change out the battery. Um, and then new um, also guidelines, basically the FDA approved Inspire to get full body MRIs. And so when it first got approved, um, you couldn't get chest MRIs um, and now basically you can get any MRI. So that's not a contraindication. And this is a video that shows how it works. Um, so this guy gets his remotes, he puts it over the battery pack and turns it on. And then you can kind of see what's happening. So basically the breathing sensor is breathing, you know, uh, picking up that the chest wall is moving in and out and that's sending the signal up to the tongue. You can see that's when the tongue's falling back and then it sends a signal up to the nerve and then the tongue is pushed forward. So that's basically how the Inspire works. Um, and CPAP works in the sense that it shunts air and opens everything up, but it's less specific. Um, and so this is very specific to the tongue base and the palate. Um, and then, so after the procedure, a lot of people want to know how fast they can use it. So we do the procedure and um, actually you will end up going back to Dr. Minor or one of the other sleep doctors and they're the ones that actually act as a fate device and kind of help you use it over time. And so um, after about a month of healing, basically you will go there um, and typically with one of the Inspire representatives, they will help um, turn on the device and confirm that it's working properly, which we also do that in the operating room. So before we wake you up um, from surgery, we confirm the device is working and that everything looks good. So we check it again once you get activated at a month later. Um, they basically establish the initial settings, which for everyone it's different. It kind of is different stimulation based on, you know, the patient's requirements. So, you know, your level one is going to be basically the lowest stimulus that creates a response. So that's a response where we can see your tongue moving and also that maybe you feel something, but it may be minor, just like a twitch, but that's your level one. And so then they send you home and they basically say, okay, so use level one for you know a week or two. And then once you feel really comfortable and feel fine, then you go up to level two. Um, and so we have each patient kind of expand their level until they get to where they feel comfortable. So we want you to get at the highest level, but we also don't want you to be noticing that it's on. We don't want you to wake up with your tongue sore or your jaw being sore. Um, and so for some people that's level four, for some people that's level eight, and it's all very um, personal. So um, you also learn how to use the sleep remote. There's a pause setting. So if you wake up and have to answer the phone or go to the bathroom, you can hit the pause button. And that usually has kind of a, a restart around 15 to 20 minutes. This is another video. So this is the sleep doctor after this guy's gotten it implanted. 
and this is the Inspire Programmer, and they've got this little um, iPad that kind of watches the stimulus. They were looking at his tongue to see if his tongue was moving, and then basically he's going over how the remote is used and you know what happens. So there's really just one button you push, it's the start button, and that either starts it or pauses it, and then there's a way that you can increase the levels. Um, so basically, after you wear the CPAP and you get to your comfortable level that's as high as possible, um, you would come back and then we want to do a post-implant sleep study to basically prove that it's working. So kind of like in the CPAP, they've got all this data to prove that it's improving your obstructive sleep apnea, because that's the main goal. Um, the Inspire, we want to do that as well, because we want to make sure that it's improving. Um, so this is just some data from some of these initial studies and um, it basically people say well how well does it work and um, this is a pretty good study that showed that you get about an 80% reduction in your AHI so the AHI is what Dr. Miner described as the apnea hypopnea index and that's how many times per hour you either have an apnea or a hypopnea and then your body is in that kind of stress mode um, and so I always tell people, you know, if you've got an AHI of 80, you know, you may not get down to zero, right? But you're still going to be in a much better range than if you were at 80. Um, so, you know, this is showing someone that has an AHI of maybe 30 before they inspire, and then after inspire, it's around six. So also people wonder about, does it help snoring? So yes, it does help snoring. And a lot of times that snoring is caused because of some floppiness of the palate and excess tissue there. Um, and so again, the Inspire is pulling the tongue forward and in um, effect, it's also pulling the palate forward, which stiffens it a little bit. Um, and so it improves snoring by about 88% as well. And a lot of patients, when they come back to follow up with me a week or two after they get it activated, you know, they may not notice something, you know, dramatic yet, but they say, well, my, you know, my, my partner says I'm not snoring anymore, which is always kind of, they're happy about that. So um, the other thing is that patients like it. So um, there's about 94% positive feedback or patients that are still using it. They're satisfied after they get the um, Inspire and get it activated and tested. Um, and then how much patients use it. So basically this is showing that most patients are using it about six hours per night every night. Um, and then there's growing adoption, you know, I think, you know, every um, few months there's more um, peer-reviewed publications coming out, there's more information coming about, out about how well this works, um, you know, they're still enrolling patients in um, registries to track, um, you know, protocols and how it's working and um, how people are liking it. Um, there is broad private insurance coverage, um, Medicare covers it, um, and many v VA and military hospitals will cover this as well. And I think some people when they come see me, they get a little frustrated that the process seems to be a little bit long, but I guess what I tell them is that, you know, we wanna do something that's gonna benefit them and we wanna do something that's gonna work for them. So we're not gonna rush you through this procedure and then you don't get the benefit. And so that's why we have kind of this process of what you have to do before you get the Inspire. Um, and so I think that's the end of my talk, and I think we're going to take some questions. Thank you, doctors. That was yeah. very informational. And we want to remind our um, audience at this time that uh, you can submit your questions in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can. And these are in no particular order. Uh, you may have covered some of it, uh, but I'll just run through the questions. Can you switch between OSA and CSA? This person moved to Colorado a year ago from Boston. They think their sleep apnea is not as well controlled. So I definitely, think. yeah, definitely you can. Do, so there's many patients who do not have any central sleep apnea. As I said, it's, that's really can be an altitude related phenomenon. There, there are conditions, primarily cardiac and neurologic conditions that can put you at higher risk for having central sleep apnea at any altitude or also the use of opiates. Uh, all those things will put you at higher risk at low altitude, but you may have none of those risk factors, be doing great at sea level. And I have patients, I have snowbirds that they go down to uh, Phoenix and they are doing great. They come up here and they've got central sleep apnea and we have to address that. And there's really, the, the same machine will tend to work for both, but absolutely that's, we can definitely see central sleep apnea develop. We can also see somebody up here who's got obstructive sleep apnea and I'm, I state my life that it's obstructive sleep apnea on the sleep study. 
we put them on CPAP, and actually it, they develop central CPAP. It's called, it's got its name, it's called Treatment Emergent Central CPAP. You put them on CPAP, and they develop central CPAP, and then you kind of, now you've got central CPAP to deal with because the, the CPAP doesn't work. But absolutely, central CPAP you can develop in, at this altitude in patients who have well treated uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Okay. What are your thoughts about CPAP cleaning machines? Do they work well, in your opinion? Yeah, so the most common one people talk about is so clean. So that's one where you, you actually set it on your nightstand and it, uh, you, you basically run the so clean machine. You put the mask in there and it basically runs ozone through your machine. So that's going to be good at sterilizing and it will tend to break down organic things like oils and stuff like that because it's ozone will tend to break things down. It's an oxidizer. It's not going to really clean it, though. I mean, if it's dirty, messy, the, bro the bro breakdown products from the oils are still going to be there. So you still need to clean it occasionally, but it's a pretty good sterilizer. It may break, it may, uh, break down the, uh, um, uh, some, com some of the components of it. Like there was a recall of the Respironix machine because there was there filters that were degrading that, that may have been made a little bit worse when you use so clean machines. There's other, uh, there's other devices that are like that. There's UV ones that I've seen. Uh, that's, the bit, that's the one that most people are kind of talking about. And like I said, it, good at sterilizing. You probably still need to have a, at least an occasional cleaning regimen too. Okay. Uh, you covered this a little bit, but uh, let's hear it again. Do you know if Inspire is covered by Medicare? Uh, what percentage? Um, it is covered by Medicare. Um, and kind of all of these insurance approvals are based on meeting these protocols. So the sleep study within two years, your BMI, um, the airway exam, um, your sleep numbers from the sleep study, and then we send all that into your insurance and then they bring us back an approval or a denial. And we don't get a ton of denials unless they're not meeting one of those criteria, which is why we're pretty stringent before we send it into insurance. And it's usually 100% then? So I don't know that I can answer that question. I don't really deal with the, the money part of it. Um, I just know that the insurance will approve it, and then depending on someone's deductible or the supplemental, that may determine how much they have to pay out of pocket. Okay, thank you. And, and I'll say too, when you're when you're uh, the CPAP is the same way, and for both for for both of these basically you got to jump through hoops and we're you know as, as sleep providers we're here to help you jump through the hoops make sure you get all the criteria so you will, this will get covered by insurance again how much of it gets paid depending on your mm -hmm. deductible and all that Medicare is usually pretty good people usually I don't have I don't have usually a lot of patients who have Medicare telling me about big bills right. as long as yeah. we did we would jump through the hoops and we'll help guide you through that okay this person has apnea they sleep with the CPAP uh, some nights they have sleep events uh, three three or less. The next night, 10 events or more. Why the difference? Sure, there can be a whole host of different reasons for that. You know, people are, and, and human beings and our, our respiratory systems are not nice, simple computers where there's always one simple answer. But a couple of the reasons can be, one is sleep position. You might've slept on your side for one night and more, and it's been more time on your back. And so the CPAP might not be as effective for that. And that sometimes is just the settings. We just have to turn up the settings, turn up the pressure. You may be on, you might be able to find pressure settings that'll work in either position. Sleep stage, REM sleep is the stage that tends to cause more sleep after because you're completely paralyzed, the muscles are completely relaxed at that time. So you may have had more REM sleep one night than the next night. Uh, again, that's something that hopefully we could address with uh, adjusting the pressures. That, uh, if we adjust the pressures, we should be able to overcome that. Um, uh, medications or drugs, like you had a couple drinks at night, your tissues are going to more, be more relaxed, and so you'll be more likely to have worse sleep apnea. Uh, you might have more nasal congestion, maybe, you know, so the air has got to go, if you're using a nasal mask, it's got to go through the nose. If you've got more nasal uh, obstruction, you're going to have a greater pressure drop across your nose when you breathe in, so the pressure is not reaching your posterior pharynx as well. So those are the, some of the, those are my kind of stock answers to that, but also there's sometimes we just, People are different. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it rains, sometimes it hails. You can't just tell. I was going to actually add to that. I think a lot of people come to us and they say, well, I can't tolerate my CPAP. And you ask why, and they say, well, I can't breathe out of your, my nose. Well, that may just be an easy enough fix that we improve their congestion and they use the CPAP, they have a lower pressure, and then they're able to tolerate the CPAP. And so there's a lot of things that we do to try to work together to get you to tolerate the best option for you. What if you are uh, a mouth breather? Right, so if you're a mouth breather, that's always in my kind of like initial discussion with sleep apnea and kind of how they're feeling. If you can't breathe through your nose, I think that's the first step. Now granted, if you have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, usually just fixing your nose is not gonna be enough to 
fix your sleep apnea. It may be enough to make you, you know, go from severe to moderate, and then you need a lower pressure on the CPAP. Um, or it may make, if you have mild sleep apnea, it may make it better enough that now you're a good, um, a good candidate for like a mandibular advancement device. Um, but our goal is always to get you to breathe as well as possible through your nose, because I think it will help all of these management strategies work better. That's how, that's how we're supposed to, that's how our system is supposed to work. You're supposed to breathe through your nose. And so if it's not, that's, I think both of us are saying the same thing. That that's a good target to go through, whether you're, whether it's you know, easily achievable, we don't know. But if you are a mouth breather, there's other options. You can wear a full face mask. So they think of like jet pilot mask, you know, like top crew, you can be like, you know, top gun. Um, they're a little bit more, they're a little more subtle, they're softer than that, a little more and more comfortable. And don't even have to go over the nose. They can just fit under the nose. Um, you can also wear a nas nasal, uh, a nasal mask with a chin strap, so it's like a neoprene sling that kind of comes down and just apply some pressure to kind of keep your mouth from popping open as easily. And there's also the, a reliable duct tape. Or a softer, there are actually some softer versions that you can use night after night, but I have a, a few of my patients that tape their mouths shut. You gotta breathe through your nose for that. <laughs> yes, yeah, but you do have to be able to breathe through your nose. Okay. Um, is Inspire as helpful for severe OAS with some hypoxia, even for someone who stops breathing as many as 35 times per hour. Yeah, so I mean, that's definitely within the range where you would be a good candidate for Inspire. I mean, it's basically indicated for people that have an AHI, which is how many times you stop breathing, of between 15 and 65 now, and that number is gonna go up to 100. And so 35 is actually a severe sleep apnea, so anything over 30 is severe. But I guess in the big scheme of things, that's not severe enough that we would say you're not a candidate for one of these procedures. The Inspire um, is, is great for that level of sleep apnea. Okay. What is BiPAP and is it the same as CPAP? It's not the same as CPAP, that's why I give it a different name. It's BiPAP means bi-level positive airway pressure as opposed to continuous positive airway pressure. And BiPAP, mean, or bi-level, uh, means that when you breathe in, the machine senses that airflow is going in, and it'll, it'll go to a higher pressure that's selected by your provider. And then as soon as the breath, the, your, ins, your inspiration ends, it'll drop down to a lower pressure. So it's kind of breathing with you a little bit more synchronously, if you will, assuming that the machine is sensing right and is do, getting its timing right. Sometimes if you're breathing fast, you have a, have a regular breathing, or just the machine's just not sensing for some reason, it can actually be fighting you a little bit. But so that's the difference between CPAP and BiPAP. ASV that I described is a form of uh, BiPAP, but it's a much more sophisticated form with this algorithm that not only does it go high, low, high, low with every breath, it actually will adjust how high it goes on a breath to breath basis. So sometimes BiPAP will be used, most common situations I'll use that for is patients that are having trouble tolerating CPAP. CPAP might be the right therapy, but they're having trouble tolerating it because they can't breathe out. So that's one of the things I said that a lot of patients will, you know, a lot of, uh, you'll, you'll hear that, oh, only half of people can tolerate CPAP. That's kind of true if you don't really work through them. So if I have a patient that says that, I may say, well, let's try BiPAP and see if you're having trouble breathing out. That way we can keep the, the, the the pressure when you're uh, when you're expired lower, but it can give you more pressure when you're inhaling, and it may be able to help. Uh, and also can help more in patients that are uh, that are obese. It can actually help drive some of the air in, air into them and help them take deeper breaths. So that's the difference between the two. And and you know which one is going to be right for you really kind of depends. We usually start with CPAP though. Okay. Are there more natural treatments to help with sleep apnea? For example, strengthening the throat and tongue. Uh, this person couldn't tolerate CPAP or an oral appliance. Yeah, there's some literature. There's the there's the relatively popular didgeridoo study. Um, so you know, it, 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 there was a study that showed that playing the didgeridoo could um, could help reduce your uh, uh, frequency of respiratory events. Also playing trumpet. So there's some things like that. Mouth exercises that may help. Uh, but those were usually there's there was a difference, but it's not like we cured sleep apnea. Usually we could kind of make it better. If you have mild sleep apnea, I've had some patients, they say, sure, go ahead and take some did or do lessons. We're, we're in Boulder, so yeah. it's not, I'm sure that, that's not a hard, hard push to find that. Um, uh, but no other uh, techniques I know besides also just, you know, not sleeping on your back is I think a pretty natural method and it can be pretty helpful. And also you can, I'll have some patients that will elevate the head of their bed too and that can help a little bit too. So patients have, that, uh, you know, sleep on your side, maybe get the head of the bed elevated and that can help. Or weight loss. I think, you know, if someone got much worse because they gained 40 pounds, you know, if they lose that weight, it may go down again. Yeah, weight loss, that's one something we didn't really cover. But uh, although not all patients who have sleep apnea have obesity, most patients who are obese will get better 
with, uh, with uh, weight loss, but it's got to be substantial weight loss. You know, five, 10 pounds is probably not going to do it. It's got to be su a substantial and sustained weight loss. And that uh, the studies, that it's hard to do studies like that because there's not many studies where people drop and keep off an awful lot of weight. The most of the, the better studies have been with uh, bariatric surgery. And generally what they show is the majority of people get better. Not that many people are cured, um, even after having bariatric surgery, and even if they get their weight down quite a bit. That may be because at that point the tissues have been stretched and they kind of sag a little bit in the back of the throat so they don't get cured. And then, unfortunately, those patients over time may tend to gain some of that weight back and, and lose some of the benefit. Okay. Uh, do you perform the surgery, as you mentioned, for people who live out of state if they come to Colorado? It's a good question. I think that's an insurance question. <laughs> So it probably depends on if your insurance will cover it out of state. Okay. What kinds of sensations does one feel with the Inspire device? Do people find it distracting if they wake up in the middle of the night as they try to get back to sleep? Will it cause you to wake up? Yeah, so that's a good question. A lot of people have that question before you put the device, the device in, but I think that's... Um, the goal is that you don't feel anything. So the goal is no, that you will not be distracted by it and you won't be woken up by it. So, you know, when you're kind of doing that ramping up period and you go from your level one to six or whatever, you know, if you notice that when you go to your level seven, you're waking up at night for some unknown reason or you have a little bit of a sore jaw or something, then you probably know that's actually a bit too high of a stimulation for you and you're gonna to wanna to go down. Um, and so there are ways, kind of just like with helping tolerate the CPAP, there are ways that we can help you tolerate the Inspire, which is sometimes to decrease the electrode um, or decrease the stimulation number. Sometimes it's to decrease or change the electrode array. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we can do to make it better. The other thing is if you wake up in the middle of the night, yeah, I usually tell people, you know, if you have to take a phone call, you should probably pause it because this thing is not specific in knowing that you're asleep when you're breathing. So anytime you breathe in, it's going to pop your tongue out. If you're trying to talk, you know, it's not going to come out very well. So basically, there is a pause mode, and um, all that to say is the goal is that you don't feel it. There are some patients that I've had that we've had to work with them a little bit kind of more closely to make sure that they get at that very, you know, specific setting for them and they typically can get through that. And then there's some people that don't feel it at all and they get to their level 10 within, you know, a month and they're good to go. Okay. And then a bonus, it's a nice party favor too. Yes. Right? My patients will, will bring it in and they'll like, hey, watch this. Well, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So they get to pretend that they're drunk and party. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a cool procedure. I mean, the first time I saw it, I was, I was very impressed. It's, it's a neat thing. Okay. Does moving to a lower elevation reduce the health risk associated with sleep apnea? Not really. Uh, if you have central sleep apnea, it may help it go away uh, if, it's, if it's altitude induced. But there's actually less evidence that central sleep, uh, the equivalent central sleep apnea has as much cardiovascular risk as obstructive sleep apnea, because it's really not, it's not really stressing the body out. It's not, your body's not sending these alarms. It's not working. Your brain's just kind of saying, no, I'm going to overbreathe and overbreathe. Your, your brain's pretty happy with it, so it's not really a stressful situation. So and there's not data, and my suspicion is that it's not actually, as, it doesn't uh, have the same serious cardiovascular risk, with the probable exception of, um, of if you have congestive heart failure and you have central sleep apnea. If we treat that, we do seem to improve the, the congestive heart failure. So if you have sleep apnea and you need surgery, what happens? Must the anesthesiology be specifically trained for the apnea patient? Well, I mean, yes. So obviously we want to, you know, that's why we do this partly at BCH because we have great anesthesiologists here who know how to manage patients that have sleep apnea. And I think any anesthesiologist should be able to be well trained in that. But yeah, so there we have a specific protocol here that's a sleep apnea protocol. After the surgery, you stay, you stay here a little bit longer than maybe a patient that doesn't have sleep apnea. We decrease the amount of narcotics you get. We make sure that you're breathing on your own before you get to go home. Um, and in most of these patients, Again, a lot of these patients that get inspired are not using a CPAP at all. Some of them are using CPAP, and we still want them to use CPAP kind of after surgery until they get it activated. So we're still managing it in some way. Um, but yes, we do treat you a little bit differently when you have sleep apnea in the operating room. Okay. Uh, is it possible to wear a backpack with the implanted device? Does the placement interfere with 
pack straps or anything? No, I mean, interestingly, I have a patient or a few patients maybe that that was their primary goal and why they wanted the Inspire is because they backpack a lot or they travel a lot and they can't carry their CPAP around or they don't have an electrical outlet or something. Um, and so, yeah, we take into account kind of where your strap sits. I think one of the patients actually brought in his backpack and we kind of looked at it to make sure that we were going to try to put it in a place where it really doesn't bother him. Um, but yeah, it usually works fine. We're going to go through a few more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Sounds good. Okay. Does the Inspire record and share any data that may be helpful to the patient or doctor? It does, yeah. So um, that's something new. It used to be, um, and since I'm not the one that kind of is managing the, the Inspire settings after they get it, um, I may be not quite as um, in tune with this, but basically, you know, the Inspire device will download to the tablet, like in that video where the, the sleep doctor was um, downloading the information, and it will give them information on, you know, kind of like the CPAP, like how often are you using it, how many hours per night are you using it, what's your AHI when it goes down. Um, there's some newer cloud-based devices um, or kind of things that we can use that we can get information and you know we can share the information through our clinics um, so we can help the patient um, and kind of be more multidisciplinary on knowing what's going on but yes we can share that information and um, we want to know that information because we want to know that it's working can you go through airport security yes you can okay um, does the hypoglossal nerve also innervate the palate um, not really. Um, there's a couple different nerves that innervate the palate, but by pulling the tongue forward, you've got multiple muscles that connect the palate to the tongue base, um, and there is some cross innervation, but it's not maybe the primary innervating nerve for the palate. But interestingly, the palate is one of the main things that we look at when we are looking to put in the Inspire, um, and um, so it comes with the tongue, I guess is what I'll say. Uh, this person, um, their son has 101 AHI and has Down syndrome. Could he still be a candidate for Inspire? So they did just approve this for patients that have Down syndrome. Um, it's a certain age range, and I'm actually not positive what the range is. I think 13 to 18. Um, and then again, the protocol is probably the same on kind of what your levels are and stuff, but it did get approved for um, Down's patients, which is great. Okay. Uh, how long is the wait to get into a doctor in the sleep center? Well, so, um, that's what I love doing this with Dr. Miner about, because then we can just text him and say, hey, this person really wants to get in and take a sleep study. But so I think, you know, we've been trying to work better together, which means that, you know, if you see me before you've gotten a sleep study or maybe and you need a new sleep study to say that you're the Inspire candidate, um, you know, we've got a fairly direct route to get a sleep study through um, BCH or um, Sleep Lab. Um, and then vice versa, if they have a patient that they feel like really needs the Inspire and they've kind of gone through all the protocol, um, they can give our office a shout. I think we um, both probably have a, a somewhat, you know, multiple week wait, but we'll, we'll make it work. And then uh, you mentioned it a little bit, but could you clarify this again, the impact of um, alcohol or a cold uh, on uh, not the sleep apnea, but the treatments that you're uh, currently under? Well, I think like Dr. Miner said, you know, anything that adds to your obstruction is going to make your AHI worse, and it can vary, right? So if you have a cold and you can't breathe out of your nose, but you normally breathe out of your nose, you may not tolerate your CPAP as well because all of a sudden you feel blocked. Um, or maybe the CPAP, you still feel a little bit tired and it didn't work as well that night because it's, you know, that pressure is not high enough to treat it. Um, and I think same with alcohol. You're a little bit more relaxed and everything falls in a little bit more. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but... You know, just as far as the alcohol, it's a muscle relaxant, so it tends to make your snoring worse. I mean, that's probably relatively common knowledge. You snore worse when you've had a few drinks or a few more than more than a few drinks. So it, it relaxes the muscles, increases, it worsens your sleep apnea the nights that you drink, uh, especially the first half of the night, not so much the second half. Okay. 